Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Friday night study, as we have been doing for quite a long time. We're reading uh, A.T. Jones, uh, the Third Angel's Message from the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. And we've gone through a number of things. Um, there's going to be about, I think, about seven or so more of these. Um, of these from the 1895, and then we're going to look at some of his other presentations. Now, one of the things that we're going to eventually get into is how Jones ended up leaving the church and what I believe happened and how he came back to the truth. And that's going to be a very complicated study. So the, uh, the waters have been muddied a little bit by, um, uh, Cloven, food, closet, cloven hooved uh, uh, feet of um, historians, Adventist historians that have really tried to uh, tarnish A.T. Jones' character. And um, so it's going to be interesting when we get there. But that that's a ways away. But I just uh, want people to know that we're going to address all of those things uh, in the future. But for now, we're looking at Joan's messages here, and, and they've been very, very powerful. This is my, this is the section, these few uh, presentations that jo Jones does that really struck me uh, when I was in my um, early 20s. So, so it was a long time ago, uh, but they, they had a deep impact on me and upon my understanding of righteousness by faith. The one thing I found is that very few people who had read these seemed to understand what Jones was saying. So I know there was a lot of people reading A.T. Jones at the time, but they were reading it through uh, the lens of the 1880 Message Study Committee for the most part. And, and sometimes that wasn't bad, especially if it was Donald K. Short. Um, uh, but some were looking at it through uh, the eyes of um, the other guy, not 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 Wieland, but the uh, guy I can never think of his name. Donald Short. Not, not Donald. Short. The other guy, the one that Jeff wrote a response to. He wrote that book. George here. Knight. Hmm. George Knight. No, no. Knight. No, not George Knight, the guy who was in the 1888 message study committee who uh, was brought in by um, Jack Sakira. Uh, heard of that name. So, so he had an impact, um, and and so that whole history in the 80s and 90s, how how the um, conservatives reacted to the attacks against. Righteousness by faith and some of the conclusions that they came to. Um, uh, the Standish brothers, their uh, part in that whole discussion. Um, they, they knew um, Desmond Ford. So all those things are, are rather interesting. Now, um, so before we pray here, just a, a little note. No, we didn't pray yet. We're going to pray. Um, so another thing is, uh, you know, this is August 11th. Um, so for me, it's 43 years since my conversion. And um, the date that I'd always marked as my conversion, August 11th. So, I, so it's, it's an interesting date in that way. And Aran and I were looking at some other interesting aspects about uh, this August 11th. But anyway, and, and during that August 11th, we had that. Uh, glacier view was happening. So it's rather interesting in that regard. But anyway, before we begin this study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the Sabbath, for the rest that we can have spiritually, or physically, mentally. And we're grateful for your presence in our lives throughout the week. And the special presence that comes on the Sabbath as we, we seek your face and you come close to us. We find, Lord, that the Sabbath um, has been a blessing to each one of us. 
especially when it comes to present truth and the truths that you reveal to us. And so we just ask that um, you can come close to us this Sabbath again. We pray for each person who is studying these things and seeking uh, your presence, seeking to know you and to reveal your character. And so we just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can do a work upon our hearts. Be with us now in this study as we read from A.T. Jones. Help us to understand these things. Be with us in our discussion and give us clear and understanding minds and open hearts. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we're just going to start reading Jones and we'll discuss some of this. Uh, we will begin our study this evening with Romans 7.25. So that's the last verse in Romans chapter 7. And um, just, right, because before that in 24, it's, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So my view on Romans 7 is that it's describing the nature of our flesh and here, this cry, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, would be the experience of Christ as well. So it doesn't mean that somebody who has a sinful body is a sinner, because Christ had a sinful body, a sinful human nature. But he did not in the least participate in sin because of his mind, right? So that's where we have this verse. So, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. John says, I repeat the expression that I made in the previous lesson, that it is in the realm of the thoughts where the law of God is served, where the contention against sin is carried on and the victory won. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, these tendencies to sin that are in the flesh drawing upon us, in this is the temptation. But temptation is not sin. Not until the desire is cherished is there sin. But as soon as the desire is cherished, as soon as we consent to it and receive it into the mind and hold it there, then there is sin. And whether that desire is carried out in action or not, the sin is committed. In the mind, in fact, we have already enjoyed the desire. In consenting to it, we have already done the thing so far as the mind itself goes. All that can come after that is simply the sensual part, the sense of enjoying the satisfaction of the flesh. This is shown in the Savior's words in Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. There is only, therefore, the only place where the Lord could bring help and deliverance to us is right in the place where the thoughts are, at the very root of the thing that is sin, the very point where the sin is conceived and where it begins. Consequently, when tempted and tried as he was, when he was spit upon, when they struck him in the face and on the head, in the trial in Jerusalem and in all his public ministry, when the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes and the priests in their iniquity and hypocrisy, which he knew, were all doing everything they could to irritate him and get him stirred up. When he was constantly tried thus, his hand was never raised to return the blow. He never had to check any such motion because not even the impulse to make any such motion was ever allowed, yet he had our human nature in which such impulses are so natural. Why then did not these motions manifest themselves in our human nature in him? So, which is really the main question. For the reason that he is was so surrendered to the will of the Father that the power of God through the Holy Spirit so worked against the flesh and fought the battle right in the field of the thoughts. Never 
in the subtlest form of the thought, was there allowed any such thing to conceive, so that under all these insults and grievous trials, he was just as calm. Our human nature in him was just as calm as it was when the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove overshadowed him on the banks of the Jordan. Now, let this mind be in you. It is not enough for a Christian to become all stirred up and say a few spiteful words or raise the hand in resentment and then say to himself, oh, I am a Christian. I must not say this or do that. No, we are to be so submitted to the power of God and to the influence of the spirit of God that our thoughts shall be so completely controlled that the victory shall be won already and not even the impulse be allowed. Then we shall be Christians everywhere and all the time under all circumstances and against all influences. But until we do reach that point, we are not sure that we shall show a Christian spirit under all circumstances and at all times and against all insults. Now, I want to make a comment here uh, regarding what Jones is saying and what he's not saying. So when, when I first became an Adventist, I went to the ABC Adventist Book Center and I picked up some books, right? So these were uh, ones that they had lots of on the shelf and uh, people had said I should read these books. And one was, um, uh, well, it was actually a couple by um, Morris Fenden. Now, uh, the one that I particularly read and, and the Holy Spirit impressed me of the error in it was uh, to know God a five-day plan. Now, uh, you know, obviously the title there is you know, meant to help sell the book. But the basic premise of the book is, is similar to what Jones is saying here, but different. And so I want to point it out. So what basically, it was a long time ago that I read it, so I don't remember it word for word or anything. But basically there was this idea that Morris Vinden had that, you know, we get to need to get to know Christ, that if we know Christ, now, of course, how we come to know Christ, he doesn't really lay that out. It's more like, you know, spending time with him, praying and so forth. But um, people can live in a very imaginary world that they know Christ, um, but they don't obey him. So I really believe that knowing Christ comes from obedience. It doesn't come from um, thinking about Jesus. But anyway. So he, he says that, you know, once you get to know Christ, that you're just not going to sin anymore. Right. So the idea to overcome sin is you just get to know Christ. And if you know him, you won't sin. Now, there's a kind of a truth in that, except um, it hides something. So one is it, it in the in the book, he uses an example which I believe is just a concept, uh, um, um, subjective example. That is, those who are seeking to perfect Christian char character will never indulge the thought that they are sinless. That is, we're not going to be looking at ourselves to see whether or not we are sinless. We know that when we look at ourselves, what we will see is that we are sinners. Because that's what we are, right? It doesn't matter if today, you know, I looked at what I did and I said, well, you know, I didn't really do anything bad today. Didn't really have any bad thoughts. So, you know, I guess I'm good, right? I overcame sin today. Um, you know, I was spending a lot of time studying the Bible and uh, you know, I was patient with anybody who interrupted me or something like that. And so I can have this imagination that I am not sinning. But does that change the past of the fact that even if I didn't sin like for 10 minutes or something, um, that doesn't mean that it changes the past, right? So there's no amount of not sinning that I can do that is going to make me not a sinner, right? Do people agree with what I'm saying here? Yes. Yeah. Right? So the fact is I am a sinner. I have sinned, and it doesn't matter how long I go without sinning. It doesn't change the fact that I'm still a sinner. And 
And we can see this in Alcoholics Anonymous. If, if an alcoholic says, well, I'm no longer an alcoholic just because I haven't drunk for a year or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, he's deceiving himself because he's still an alcoholic. And he has to keep that always in mind, that he needs God every day to keep him from falling. So there's nothing in what Jones is trying to say here that changes that, right? He's not trying to say that, you know, we're going to have this this impulse. We're going to be like Christ where this impulse is not even allowed. I mean, we are, are going to be like that, but we're not looking for that. That's not what a Christian is seeking to do. We're not seeking to just um, stop from sinning, right? In that sense, in the in the immediate time. Now he's he's making a point here that we can't make any provision for the flesh, so that it has to start somewhere earlier if we're going to stop from sinning. So he's using this example, you know. So we we start get feeling resentful, and so we just stop ourselves because well, I shouldn't do that. Now, he's correct. That is not um, how the Christian will live if he's converted. He's not going to constantly struggle with every single thing that comes along and just say, well, I'm not going to do it because we actually don't have the power to just change ourselves. So, So this becomes a bit of a problem as we start to look at what he's saying, because there are things that he's not saying, but that are often taken in a certain way. So, so we're going to go through this, and and we'll, you'll see what I mean once we go through what he says. Um, so he says, as I stated in the previous lesson, the things that were heaped upon Christ and which he bore were the very things that were the hardest for human nature to bear. And we, before we get through with the cause in which we are engaged, are going to have to meet these very things that are the hardest for human nature to bear. And unless we have the battle won already and are Christians indeed, we are not sure that we shall show the Christian spirit in these times when it is most needed. In fact, the time when the Christian spirit is most needed is all the time. Now, in Jesus, the, in Jesus, the Lord has brought to us just the power that will give us into the hand of God and cause us to be so submitted to him that he shall so fully control every thought that we shall be Christians all the time and everywhere, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The kingdom of God is within you. Christ dwells within us, and he is the king. The law of God is written upon the heart, and that is the law of the kingdom. Where the king and the law of the kingdom are, there is the kingdom. In the inmost recesses, the secret chamber of the heart, at the very root, the fountain of the thought, there Christ sets up his throne. There the law of God is written by the Spirit. There the king asserts his authority and sets forth the principles of his government and allegiance to that, uh, to that is Christianity. Um, and it says six. So, so just cited it, it recognizes that this doesn't make sense. Anyway, thus at the very citadel of the soul, the very citadel of the thoughts, the very place, the only place where sin can enter. There God sets up his throne. There he establishes his kingdom. There he puts his law and the power to cause the authority of the law to be recognized and the principles of the law to be carried out in the life. And the result is peace only and all the time. That is the very thing that Christ hath brought to us and which comes to us in the mind of Christ. So one is we can see that this is a work of God, not a work of man. We can't bring God into his throne. We can't establish God, right? So this is a work that God does. And, and Jones, uh, sometimes, because he doesn't know the controversies that are going to exist in our time, he's not necessarily as careful as he should should be or could be if he knew about what was how his words were going to be taken. But we'll, we'll come back to that. So what, what he's going to say here and what he means. Let us look at that a little further. When Christ had our human nature, 
He was there in his divine self, but didn't manifest any of his divine self in that place. Right? So we know he's giving us an example of not manifesting self. Right? So self can never overcome sin. Christ showed that even though he had the divine self as our example, he never manifested his divine self to overcome sin, right? So Jones had made that clear earlier. What did he do with his divine self in our flesh when he became ourselves? His divine self was always kept back, emptied, in order that our evil satanic selves might be kept back, emptied. Now, in the flesh, he himself did nothing. He says, of my own self, I can do nothing. He was there all the time. His own divine self who made the heavens was there all the time. But from beginning to end, he himself did nothing. Himself was kept back. He was emptied. Who then did that which was done in him? The father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He speaks the world. Um, He speaks the words. I don't know if it's he speaks the worlds. That doesn't make sense. Then it must be he speaks the words. Okay, then who was it that opposed the power of temptation in him, in our flesh? The father. It was the father who kept him from sinning. He was kept by the power of God, as we are to be kept by the power of God. First Peter 1, 5. He was our sinful selves in the flesh and here were all these tendencies to sin being stirred up in his flesh to get him to consent to sin but he himself did not keep himself from sinning to have done so would have been himself manifesting himself against the power of satan and this would have destroyed the plan of salvation even though he had not sinned and though at the cross the words were said in mockery they were literally true He saved himself. He saved others. Himself, he cannot save. Therefore, he kept himself entirely out. He emptied himself. And by his keeping himself back, that gave the Father an opportunity to come in and work against the sinful flesh and save him and save us in him. Now, so Jones is is showing that Christ is an example of depending upon the Father. That is, Christ could have overcome sin in himself, even in sinful flesh, because he's God. But he chose not to overcome sin by himself. He chose to depend upon his father to be our example. Now, you sometimes run into this idea, and this is what Morris Venon was sort of peddling, is this idea, well, you don't need to fight against sin at all. You just need to connect with the Father. And and Jones is not saying that there is no battle. But the battle is not with sin. The battle is the battle with self. Correct? Uh, Yes, because it's, uh, I want to do this, I want to do that. So sin is just the manifestation of self exerting itself manifesting itself right so sin is a symptom of something and what has to be overcome is self and it's in order to overcome self we need god to overcome self right because we can't crucify ourselves right you can't crucify yourself and self needs to be crucified So we need God, we need Christ to do this work in us. And there's a work of cooperation then, right? Because we have to yield ourselves to God. So this idea just that, you know, we focus upon sin itself can be very deceptive because we may not recognize the sin in ourselves. We may look at ourselves and see that we're okay. Um. A friend of mine who's been studying with his mom, she finally has recognized for the first time in her life that she's a sinner. And this is something that, you know, um, 
you know, we probably take for granted as being Christians. But I know for myself, I did not see myself as a sinner. At least as somebody who was a sinner in the sense that I couldn't overcome sin until 43 years ago today. Right. So the first time, even though I was you know, 17 years old and I you know, knew about Christianity, I read lots of books and so forth. It never really struck me until August 11th, 1980, that I was indeed a sinner. And the verse that came to my mind is men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And so I recognized that I'd been hiding my sin from myself and from God this whole time, trying to be good. Now, obviously, I knew in some sense that I did things that I didn't want to do. But to me, I wasn't really a sinner, right? That is, I didn't recognize that I was a sinner. I just thought there was actions that I did that I didn't want to do, if that makes sense to people, right? So we may, we may, you know, think that we make mistakes. We do things we don't want to do. We stumble, we fall. But the idea of being a sinner is quite a different idea than just that I do bad things, right? I hope people can see the difference. So to see yourself as a sinner, you see yourself hopeless. And then when you see yourself as a sinner, you recognize you need a savior. And, and so that's what happened to me. So, um, so the father has this opportunity to come and work against the sinful flesh and save him and save us in him. So in Christ, we can be saved. So Jones goes on, sinners are separated from God and God wants to come back to the very place from which sin has driven him in human flesh. He could not come to us in ourselves, for we could not bear his presence. Therefore, Christ came in our flesh and the father dwelt with him. He could bear the presence of God in its fullness. And so God could dwell with him in his fullness and this could bring the fullness of God to us in our flesh. Now, Jones is being very you know, technical here in some ways, right? He's trying to be very clear because he has a point to make. Christ came in that sinful flesh, but did not do anything of himself against the temptation and the power of sin in the flesh. So you could take this as this is the way Morris Venden would take it and many followers of um uh, the 1888 message study committee, they would look at this sentence and say, well, we, we can't do anything against temptation and power of sin in the flesh. So that's just Christ is going to take care of that, right? But there still is a battle to be fought. The battle is is not simply just saying, you know, God's going to take care of it. I'm just going to go about my way and just live my life and let him take care of this because this is his problem. I'm just going to get to know him. We know that there's a battle still to be fought. So, so it's going to be clear as we go through these studies here. Okay. He emptied himself and the father worked in human flesh against the power of sin and kept him from sinning. So that's the power we need. We need the power, but how we get that power is part of of the issue, right? How different people view that. Now it is written of the Christian, ye are kept by the power of God through faith, right? So that's where we need to understand is what this faith is. That is done in Christ. We yield to Christ. Christ abides in us, giving us his mind. That mind of Christ enables our wicked self to be in the background. The mind of Christ, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, puts our wicked selves beneath and keeps ourselves back and keeps us from asserting ourselves. For any manifestation of ourself is of itself sin. When the mind of Christ puts ourselves beneath, that gives the Father a chance to work with us and keep us from sinning. And thus God worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Uh, 
So Stephen, it looks like you're on a bad uh, sleeping schedule. Anyway, thus it is, welcome to the study. Thus it is always the Father and Christ and ourselves. It is the Father manifested in us through Christ and in Christ. The mind of Christ empties us of our sinful selves and keeps us from asserting ourselves in order that God, the Father, may join himself to us and work against the power of sin and keep us from sinning. Thus Christ is our peace, who hath made both God and us one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So it is always the Father and Christ, and we, we the sinners, God the sinless, Christ joining the sinless one to the sinful one, and in himself abolishing the enmity, emptying self in us, in order that God may be, one, may be one, and thus make one new man, so making peace. And thus the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through or in Jesus Christ. So hopefully you can see what Jones is saying here. Now, what he's done is he's sort of, he's torn apart this whole picture, right? That's what he's been doing in these studies of how we understand the nature of man, the nature of sin, our relationship with God. And then he starts to put it back together. So he starts to bring some of these other statements that he had used earlier. So if we think about what he's saying, that we know that this enmity against sin is what? What is the enmity against sin? Because we know the flesh is enmity against God. So what is the enmity that God gives us against sin? What is it? So we know we have the enmity against God. That's the flesh. So what is it that abolishes that enmity? What is it that can keep us from falling? The mind talking. of Christ. The mind of Christ, right? So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that mind is not my mind, right? That is, that's Christ's mind. That's his faith. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And so, I mean, we're dealing with language here. We're trying to define something that, that in some ways is difficult to define. It's much easier to experience. But... Um, but we need to understand it. We need to be able to explain it to others and help them in this. So we know that we need the mind of Christ. And, and that mind of Christ is comes from Jesus Christ himself, right? So it's it's Christ in us and in Christ. So anyway, let's go on and read and we'll see what he's saying. Is it not a most blessed thing that the Lord Jesus has done that for us and so takes up his abode in us and so settles that question that there can be no more doubt that the father will keep us from sinning than there is that he has kept him from sinning already. No more doubt because when Christ is there, he is there for the purpose of emptying self in us. And when our selves are gone, will it be any Will it be any very great difficulty for the Father to manifest himself? When our cells are kept from asserting ourselves, there will be no difficulty for God to assert himself in our flesh. That is the mystery of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. God manifests in the flesh. It is not simply Christ manifest in the flesh. It is God manifest in the flesh. For when Jesus came to the world himself, it was not Christ manifest in the flesh. It was God manifest in the flesh. For he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 
Christ emptied himself in order that God might be manifest in the flesh, in sinful flesh. And when he comes to us and dwells in us upon our choice, bringing to us that divine mind of his, which is the mind that empties self wherever it goes, wherever it can find an entrance, wherever it can find any place to act. The mind of Christ is the emptying of self. It is the abolishing of self, the destruction of self, the annihilation of self. Therefore, by our choice, that divine mind comes to us. The result is as certain that our selves will be emptied as when that as that mind dwells in us. And as soon as that is done, God works fully and manifests himself in sinful flesh, though it be. And that is victory. That is triumph. And thus with the mind, I serve the law of God. The law is manifested. It is fulfilled. Its principles shine in the life because the life is the character of God manifest in human flesh, sinful flesh, through Jesus Christ. It seems to me that that ought that thought ought to raise every one of us above all the power of Satan and of sin. It will do that as certainly as we surrender to that divine mind and let it abide in us as it abode in him. It will do it. Indeed, the word to us all the time is arise, shine. But we cannot raise ourselves. It is the truth and power of God that is to raise us. But is not here the direct truth that will raise a man? Yes, sir. It will raise him from the dead, as we shall find before we get done with this. But this thought was necessary to be followed through, that we may see how complete the victory is and how certain we are of it, as surely as we surrender to Christ and accept that mind that was in him. And thus always bear in mind that the battle is fought against sin in the realm of the thoughts and that the victor, the warrior that has fought the battle there and won the victor, victory there is every, every conceivable in every seat, in every conceivable kind of contest. That same blessed one comes and sets up his throne at the citadel, citadel of the very imagination of the thought, the very root of the thought, of the heart, of the believing sinner. He sets up his throne there and plants the principles of his law there and reigns there. Thus it is that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so now in this way might grace reign. Did sin reign? Certainly. Did it reign with power? Assuredly, it reigned, it ruled. Well, as that has reigned, even so grace shall reign. Is grace then to reign as certainly, as powerfully, in fact, as ever sin did? Much more, much more fully, much more abundantly, much more gloriously. Just as certainly as ever sin did reign in us, so certainly when we are in Jesus Christ, of the grace of God is to reign much more abundantly. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. That being so, we can go on in victory unto perfection. Now, I just want to go back here because um, Jones has um, has made a point that, that, and then he kind of jumps to something else because he's focusing here upon the fact that Christ has gained the victory, right? So, but that victory is the victory over self. Now, when we look at ourselves, um, we don't see that we have victory over self because do we always have self to contend with? Yes. Did, did Christ always have self to contend with? Yes. No, it was his divine self. And, and you can see how for Christ not to exert his divine self when he has the power to overcome sin. I mean, we exert ourselves even though we don't have the power to overcome sin. Christ could have overcome sin with his divine self. Though in doing so, he would have been exerting, asserting self, and thus he would have not been our savior. But, you know, we have this victory 
that Christ has gained for us because he has overcome self and he offers that to us. But you can see that if we start to think of ourselves as good, if we start to say, I've overcome, then don't we see that self is just rising up again? That in order for us to overcome, we can never look at ourselves as good. Right? It's we can never that saying that I overcame, you know. Yeah. And and even if we say, well, I overcame by God's grace, the thing is, if we see ourselves as overcomers in the sense of by sight, that is, we look at ourselves and say, you know, I haven't sinned since March, then that we actually have deceived ourselves because we've now asserted self. We think it's about us overcoming, not about Christ overcoming in us. Because those that are going to face the time of trouble, that is, they're going to live in the sight of the Holy God without a mediator, do not have confidence in themselves. Right? They don't say, you know, I've been living for the last you know, five months without sinning. And so now as I go through this trial, I know that I'm not going to sin. No, what they know is I'm a sinner. And unless I'm depending upon Christ 100%, I'm not going to pass this test. And in fact, they see in themselves no good, no good thing, just as Christ didn't see in himself any good thing. They don't see themselves as righteous because if they did, then that would be the asserting of self. So their righteousness is totally in Christ. But that doesn't mean that they just don't have a battle to face. They do. They still are battling self. So that battle with self, even though Christ gained that victory for us, is still always very real in the Christian life. It doesn't cease Self is always there trying to assert itself. Always trying to make us trust in ourselves rather than trust in God. Right? To live by sight instead of by faith. Okay. So Jones goes on. From that height, for it is proper to call it a height, to which this truth raises us. We can go on enjoying reading with gratitude what we have in him and receiving it in the fullness of the soul. But unless we have the Lord to take us to that height and seat us there and put us where he has possession of the citadel so that we are certain where he is and in that where we are, all these other things are vague, indefinite, and seem to be beyond us, sometimes almost within our reach. And we long to get where we can really have hold on them and know the reality of them. But yet they're always just a little beyond our reach and we're not, and we are unsatisfied. But when we surrender fully, completely, absolutely, with no reserva reservation, letting the whole world and all there is of it go, then we receive that divine mind of his by the spirit of God that gives to him possession of that citadel that lifts us to that height uh, where all these other things are not simply within reach. Oh no, they are in the heart and are rejoicing in the life. We then in him have them in possession and we know it. And the joy of it is just what Peter said, unspeakable and full of glory. Now, when he says we know it, how do we know it? What is, what is John saying in first John? How do we know that we know God? Do we know it by sight? Can we look at our life and our actions and say, I know it because I've done this and so and so? Not by sight or by feeling. Right. But by faith. Right. So, yeah. I mean, showing how Christ is an example of righteousness by faith. And here he's trying to lift us up to recognize what faith can do for us. But he's not suggesting that 
you know, once we have this certain type of experience, everything is just easygoing and we're just going to constantly be seeing ourselves as righteous, right? So he's not saying that. But some people take what he's saying here and use it in that way because he's trying to focus upon the victory that Christ has and what we can experience in him, right? That's why we have this in him. Then in him, have them in possession. We then in him have them in possession and know it and the joy of it, just as P what Peter said, unspeakable and full of glory. So then, as the Lord has lifted us to this height and will hold us there, now let us go ahead and read and receive as we read what we have in him. Begin with Romans 6, 6. That is the scripture that we have studied so far this e evening. Knowing this, knowing what? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, good, in Jesus Christ, in his flesh, was not human nature, sinful flesh crucified? Whose? Who was he? He was man. He was ourselves. Then whose sinful flesh, whose human nature was crucified on the cross of Jesus Christ? Mine. Therefore, as certainly as I have that blessed truth settled in my heart and mind, that Jesus Christ was man, human nature, sinful nature, and that he was myself in the flesh, as certainly as I have that, it follows just as certainly as that he was crucified on the cross, so was I. My human nature, myself there, was crucified there. Therefore, I can say with absolute truth and the certainty and confidence of the faith, I am crucified with Christ. It is so. We hear people so many times say, I want self to be crucified. Well, we turn and read the text to them, knowing this, that our old man is crucified. And they respond, well, I wish it were so. Turn to the next text and read, I am crucified with Christ. It says, I am. Who is? Are you? Still the answer, I don't see that I am. I wish it were so, but I cannot see how I'm crucified. And I cannot see how reading that there and saying that it is so will make it so. But the word of God says so, and it is so because it says so. And it would be true and everlastingly effectual if that were all there is to it. But in this case, it is so because it is so. God does not speak that word to make it so in us. He speaks that word because it is so in us, in Christ. Now, this is where um, Jack Sakira tries to talk about that Christ is crucified for every man. He's forgiven every man. And so every man is crucified in Christ. Every man is justified. Now, that's not what Jones is really saying here. Now, the person, what is the problem that the person has who says, I don't see that I am crucified with Christ? What is the problem with that person? Unbelief. Okay. But also they say, I don't see that I am. So what are they doing? Living by sight. Okay. So they're living by sight. So if we look at ourselves, we need to expect to see that we are not in Christ. We expect to see ourselves as sinners. Now, one of the things that people who are sinners generally don't see is see themselves as sinners. You could be the most vile criminal and you don't see yourself as a sinner. Now, why is that? Why do people who are unconverted not see themselves as sinners? Why did I not see myself as a sinner, even though I knew I was doing bad things? prior to August 11th, 1980. Or maybe you don't agree that people who aren't converted don't see themselves as sinners. Well, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 does say that Satan has blinded their minds. Okay. In the godless world, and yeah, I haven't met too many 
people who don't know Christ that that think they're sinners? Yeah, people who don't know Christ, they generally don't think they're sinners. Now, if they do start to see themselves as a sinner, it's because Christ is being revealed to them, right? I mean, I've had lots of really good people, and only Christians are bad, right? But everything that they do that's bad, they justify it, right? That's what I used to do. I used to justify even though I knew I was doing bad things, I would have excuses for them. You know, I once had a, a guy working for me at the guitar store. Um, he worked for me for well, well over a year. Um, and he was late every time except twice. There's only two times he was ever on time. And every time he was late, it was never his fault. You know, the power would go off. His alarm clock would not wake him up. He, I've never seen a person with so many flat tires in my life or who drove in the ditch so often, but every single time his tire was flat and every time he drove in the ditch and every time he didn't wake up to his alarm clock, it was never his fault. Now, was it his fault? Or, or do you believe that he just had such bad luck that for, you know, four or five hundred times, he, he couldn't get to work on time? So, so you can see how somebody can just justify their actions, never, ever take responsibility um, for what they have done. Right. And, and the further somebody is from God the less likely they are to take responsibility for their actions. So when this guy says, I don't see that I am, part of the problem is he's judging God's word based upon his experience. Now, in some ways, God is working in his life because he can't see that he's doing the right things. Right? So, when, when we have a conviction of sin, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> okay, so Jones is going to go on here and talk about faith, right? And about um, what he's going to talk about here first about who, who God is. So he's going to go back to Hebrews chapter 1 first. So in the first chapter of Hebrews, you remember we had an illustration of this. God did not call Christ God to make him God. No, he called him God because he was God. If he had not been that, then for God to speak to him the word of God and lay it upon him would have caused him to be that because that is the power of the word of God. But that it is, but that is is not it. That would be so if that were all there were to it. But it is so also in another way. He was God, and when God called him God, he did so because that he was because that is what he was. So in that double sense, it is everlastingly so. It is so by two immutable things. Now it is the same way here. Our old man is crucified, yet when God sets forth his word that it is so, we accepting that word and surrendering to it. It is so to each one who accepts it because the word has the divine power in it to cause it to be so. By that means, it would be everlastingly so, even if that were all there is to it. But that is not all there is to it, because in Jesus Christ, human nature has been crucified on the cross, actually, literally. And that is my human nature, that is myself in him, that was crucified there. And therefore, God sets down the record of everyone who is in Christ. He is crucified. So that by the two immutable things, by the double fact, it is so. Therefore, we can say with perfect freedom, it is no boasting. It is not presumption in any sense. It is simply the confession of faith in Jesus Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Is not he crucified? And as certainly as I am with him, am I not crucified with him? The word of God says so. 
our old man is crucified with him. Very good. Let us thank the Lord that that is so. And what is the use then of our trying, longing to get ourselves crucified, crucified so that we can believe that he, we are accepted of God? Why, it is done, thank the Lord. In him it is done, as certainly as the soul, by faith, sinks self in Jesus Christ, and by that divine power which he has brought to us to do it. So certainly it is done as a divine fact, and it is only the genuine expression of faith to tell, to acknowledge that divine fact that I am crucified with Christ. Jesus sunk his divine self, in our human nature and altogether was crucified. And when we sink ourselves in him, it is still so still because in him only it is done. It is all in him. We call attention to the thought we had in the lesson a few evenings ago that it is not in him in the sense of his being a receptacle to which we can go and take it out and apply it to ourselves. No, but it is in him in the sense that it is all there. And when we are in him, then we go into the receptacle, then we sink into him, and we have it all in him as we are in him. Therefore, now, let every soul of us say by the faith of Jesus Christ, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He is alive again. And because he lives, we live also. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. The faith of the Son of God. That divine faith which he brought to human nature and which he gives to you and to me. We live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Oh, he loved me when he gave himself in all his glory and all his wondrous worth for me. It was nothing. Is it much that I should give myself to him? But there is more of the verse, Romans 6, 6 still, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Good. In him, we have the victory, victory from the service of sin. There is victory over the service of sin in this knowing that we are crucified with him. Now, I say that this, I say that this blessed fact, which we find in him, lifts us right to that place. Yea, the fact holds us in the place that is there, that is so. There is a power in it. That is a fact. We have occasion to see it more fully presented. When he was crucified, what followed? When he was nailed to the cross, what came next? He died. Now read in this same chapter, 8th verse. Now if we be dead in Christ, well, what else can there be? As certainly as I am crucified with him, I shall be dead with him. Being crucified with him, we shall be dead with him. Dead with him? Do we know that? Look back at the 4th verse. When he had been crucified and had died, what followed? He was buried the burial of the dead, and one of us. Now, therefore, we are buried with him. Buried with him? Were we crucified with him? Did we die with him? Have the Father and Christ wrought out in human nature the death of sinful self? Yes. Whose? Mine. Then do you not see that all this is a gift of faith that is to be taken with everything else that God gives of faith? The death of the old man is in Christ, and in him we have it, and thank God for it. With him the old man was crucified. With him the old man died, and when he was buried, the old man was buried. My human, old, sinful self was crucified, died, and was buried with him. And with him it is buried yet, when I am in him. Out of him I have it not, of course. Everyone that is outside of him has none of this. In him it is, in him. And we receive it all by faith in him. We are simply studying now the fact that we have in him the facts we are given to us in him and which are to be taken by faith. These are facts of faith. So you can see Jones is not supporting the idea that 
since he died for every man, every man is justified. That it only occurs when we're in Christ. Now, this is, this is, and, and to be in Christ is something that we have to do every moment, right? To connect with Christ. It's not something that we did once in the past. So even though 43 years ago I was converted, if that's all that had happened, I gave my, my heart to the Lord then, but I never gave my heart to the Lord ever after. I would not be in Christ, right? I have to do this. I have to die daily, Paul says. So we thank the Lord that this is literal fact, that our old man is crucified, dead, and buried with him, and that in him we have that gift. In him we have the gift and the fact of the death of the old man, the death of the human sinful nature and the burial of it. And when that old thing is crucified and dead and buried in the next verse, the seventh, he that is dead is freed from sin. So then, knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that henceforth we should not serve sin, we are free from the service of sin. Brethren, I am satisfied it is just as much our place day by day now to thank God for freedom from the service of sin as it is to breathe. I say it over. I say it. It is just as much our place, our privilege, and our right to claim in Christ, in him only, and as we believe in him, and to thank God for freedom from the service of sin, as it is to breathe the breath that we breathe as we get up in the morning. How can I ever have the blessing and benefit there is in that thing if I do not take the thing? If I'm always hesitating and afraid, that I'm not free from the service of sin, how long will it take me to get free from the service of sin? That very hesitating, that very fear is from doubt, it is from unbelief, and is sin in itself. But in him, when God has wrought out for us, indeed, freedom from the service of sin, we have the right to thank God for it. And as certainly as we claim it and thank him for it, we shall enjoy it. He that is dead is freed from sin. Margin is justified from sin. And it is in him, and we have it as we are in him by faith. Now, therefore, read the first verse of the sixth of Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead in sin live, live any longer therein? Now, um, I just want to make a comment here about this first, just from, um, uh, let me see. Okay, where's the verse here? So he says it's the first verse of the sixth of Romans. Um, I'm just trying to find the verse. That I, um, no, it's here. He says something very similar. Okay, so in Romans 6.14, so this just reminds me of when I was a kid um, talking to my dad and I was talking about um, the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And he said, for ye are not under the law, but under grace, right? So that's Romans 6.14. And uh, verse, but I said, well, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace, God forbid. Now, my dad said, well, the first part is inspired. The second part is Paul's opinion. And uh, so that kind of struck me at the time of, well, one is not to listen to my dad. Um, but this this idea of, of what it means to be under grace Right. So often what Christians do is they say, well, grace just is God's just going to forgive me. I'm under his grace. Um, but we know that there is a work that needs to be done by grace. His grace uh, saves me from sin. So anyway, it just reminds me of that. Um, what yeah. shall we say? What's that? I was thinking of uh, cheap, cheap grace. Yeah. Cheap grace. Yeah. Right. So when we say, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound, 
right? We obviously know that grace is something that is a power to overcome sin. So how we so Paul instead of just you know contradicting contradicting it straight off, he says, you know, in response to that question, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? Right? So he's showing that it's God great it's God's grace that makes us dead to sin. Right? So Jones goes on, he says, Can a man live on what he died of? No. Then when the man has died of sin, can he live in sin? Can he live with sin? A man dies of delirium, tremens, or typhoid fever. Can he live on delirium, tremens, or typhoid fever, even if by a possibility he should be brought to live long enough to realize that he was there? The very thought of it would be death to him because it killed him once. So it is with the man who dies of sin. The very appearance of it, the very bringing of it before him, after that is death to him. If he has uh, consciousness enough and life enough to realize that it is there, he will he will die um, he will die of it again. He cannot live on what he died of. But the great trouble with many people is that they do not get sick enough to, of sin to die. That is the difficulty. They get sick, perhaps, of some particular sin. And they want to stop that and want to die to that. And they think that they have left that off. And then they get sick of some other particular sin that they think is not becoming to them. They cannot have the favor and estimation of the people with that particular sin so manifest. And they try to leave that off. Um, But they do not get sick of sin, sin in itself, sin in the conception, sin in the abstract, whether it be in one particular way or another particular way. They do not get sick enough of sin itself to die to sin. When the man gets sick enough, not of sins, but of sin, the very suggestion of sin and the thought of sin, why you cannot get him to live in it anymore. He cannot live in it. It killed him once and he cannot live in what he died of. We have constantly the opportunity to sin. Opportunities to sin are ever presented to us. Opportunities to sin and live in it are presented day by day. But it stands written, always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus. I die daily. As certainly as I have died to sin, the suggestion of sin is death to me. It is death to me in him. Therefore, this is put in the form of a surprised, astonished question. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Baptism means baptism into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Turn to Colossians. There was the word you remember that we had in Brother Durland's lesson one day, Colossians 2.20. Therefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, the elements of the world, worldliness, and this thing that leads to the world, the enmity, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to the world? That is simply speaking of our deliverance from the service of sin. It is simply saying, in other words, what is said in Romans 6, 6, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Why? As though living outside of him, we are still doing those same things? No, sir. Romans 6.14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. The man who is delivered from the domination of sin is delivered from the service of sin. Jesus Christ, it is a fact, too. So read on from Romans 6, 6 6-14. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Is he alive? Yes, thank the Lord. Who died? Jesus died. And we are dead with him, and he is alive. And we who believe in him are alive with him. That, however, will come more fully afterward. 
Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Let us hold to this. Let us thank God this moment and hence forward, day by day, with every thought, I am crucified with him. As certainly as he is crucified, I am crucified. As certainly as he is dead, I am dead with him. As certainly as he is buried, I was buried with him. As certainly as he is risen, I am risen with him. And henceforth, I shall not serve sin. In him, we are free from the dominion of sin and from the service of sin. Thank the Lord for his unspeakable gift. So <clears throat> hopefully it's clear. I mean, Jones is trying to make a point. And people take this point and take it out of its context. I think Jones is Jones is pretty clear so far. Yeah, yeah he's very hopeful. Yeah. And the thing is to trust in what God has done, to trust his word. So in spite of what we see in our lives, we know that if we go to God, he is there to give us a victory. And that victory isn't something we look for in ourselves to decide if if God has given us the victory. Right? We're not looking to ourselves. We're looking to him. And so we expect to see ourselves as sinners. And we expect that if we see ourselves as sinners, if we're in Christ, we're going to constantly confess and forsake our sin. We're not looking to stop from sinning so that we can believe God can stop us from sinning. We can't put the cart before the horse. So Jones is placing before us what God wants to do in us, what he has done in us already in Christ, so that we can trust and believe in spite of what we see, that he can do this in us. Because the big objections that people have to righteousness by faith is, well, you know, everybody's a sinner. You know, everybody we see sins and we see ourselves sinning. And so, so obviously this righteousness by faith stuff can't be about overcoming sin. We just need to trust that, you know, he did it for us one time and 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 we're never going to overcome sin so you might as well stop trying right that's the error that people that's, come to that's what's, that's what's it implying that seems to be implying so you know this thing we're just going to keep sinning till jesus comes which i ran into when i first became an adventist you know because we have a sinful nature we're always going to keep sinning we just try to do our best you know and god does the rest um is not a Christian concept because our best is absolutely nothing. And, and God wants to do it in us. He wants to perfect his character in us. He wants us to have the mind of Christ because we have to stand in the sight of the Holy God without a mediator. And we can't do that on our own. We have to learn to distrust self and trust fully in God. So anyway, thanks everyone for the study, and um, uh, let's close with thank a word. Thank you, thank you, Ep Sabbath. Yeah. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the words of your servant in the past that speak so strongly to us in the present. We know, Lord, that when we look at ourselves, we see no good thing. But we can trust in Christ. Help us, Lord, to live each day surrendering to you, allowing you to work in our lives, allowing Christ to live in us by faith and that we can trust in him. We know, Lord, that these words sometimes don't mean anything to us because we're so focused upon self. But we know, Lord, that you are speaking to our hearts. You're bringing a conviction of sin in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that we can trust fully in you. Be with each person. Bless them on the Sabbath. And we pray for Dwight's study tomorrow morning, that we'll be drawn closer to you and to one another. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.